This program was made possible by the Lincoln Ethics Series, funded by the David and Joan Lincoln Family Fund for Applied Ethics and the Kevin and Joan Keough Family Fund. Welcome to CHQ Assembly. My name is Matt Ewalt, and I serve Chautauqua Institution as Vice President and Emily and Richard Smucker Chair for Education. It's a privilege to welcome you to the Chautauqua Lecture Series program. Today's program is part of a week titled The Ethics of Tech, Scientific, Corporate, and Personal Responsibility, in which we grapple with the outsized and sometimes harmful role of technology in our lives and society. Should big tech companies, as their sheer size and influence raise antitrust questions, be permitted to self-police? Or is an industry-wide code of ethics or government regulation necessary to ensure safety in a future dominated by artificial intelligence, datafication, and facial recognition? Our guides this week are some of the top thinkers on technological advancements and the ethical conundrums they present. They will provide guidance on how we can take personal responsibility as consumers and users. Today, we will hear from Rana L. Kalyubi, a computer scientist, technologist, entrepreneur, and business leader, and author of the recently released book, Girl Decoded, A Scientist's Quest to Reclaim Our Humanity by Bringing Emotional Intelligence to Technology. Dr. L. Kalyubi is co-founder and CEO of Effectiva, where she invented the company's award-winning Emotion AI platform, which uses deep learning and massive amounts of data to analyze complex and nuanced emotions and cognitive states from face and voice. She is now pioneering human perception AI, technology that can understand all things human. Effectiva's technology is used by leading companies in the automotive industry, as well as in business, healthcare, education, social robotics, and conversational interfaces. A frequent speaker on innovation, women in technology, ethics in AI, and leadership, Dr. El Kalyubi was recently included in Forbes' list of America's top 50 women in tech and Wired's list of 25 geniuses who are creating the future of business. We are so honored to feature her work and perspective among our CHQ Assembly offerings during this week on the ethics of tech. Before we begin today's Chautauqua Lecture, our live audience should know that you may submit questions for our Q&A with Ms. El Kalyubi through the submission portal at questions.chq.org from any mobile or desktop browser, or on Twitter using the hashtag CHQ2020. Today's remarks were pre-recorded on July 15th from Dr. El Kalyubi's home near Boston, Massachusetts. They will be followed by a live Q&A with questions submitted by our live audience tuning in around the world. Chautauqua, we are pleased to present to you Dr. Rana L. Kalyubi. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction. Hi, everybody. I'm Rana L. Kalyubi. I'm co-founder and CEO of Affectiva. We are an MIT spin-out on a mission to humanize technology. I'm also the author of my new memoir, Girl Decoded, which was published by Penguin Random House in April. So it was kind of interesting. I had to pivot to a virtual book tour. Um, I was so looking forward to doing this in person. I still hope we will meet and, and be together at some point in the future. In the meantime, I hope you're all staying well and staying connected. So I wanted to share my thoughts around why do we need to build human-centric AI and why do we need to build emotional intelligence into our technology? What are the applications of this technology today and in the future? And perhaps most importantly, what are the ethical considerations and moral implications of building empathy and emotional intelligence into our technology? A little bit about myself and my background. I grew up in, I'm originally Egyptian, so I grew up in Cairo and around the Middle East. I was in Kuwait until the first Gulf War, after which uh, we moved to Abu Dhabi. I was there for a number of years, went back to uh, study computer science at the American University in Cairo. At the time, I got so fascinated by the role technology plays in connecting uh, people and how it changes the way we connect and communicate. And that's been a common thread uh, across my research and uh, my work um, over the last you know, 25 plus years. From then on, I had the opportunity to go do my PhD at Cambridge University. 
I got to Cambridge and I, it was my first experience uh, studying abroad and I realized, I had this kind of aha moment, I realized I was spending more time in front of my device than I did interacting with any other human being, which in an ironic way is, is very reflective of, of the times we're in today with, with all of our communications um, becoming virtual. Yet I realized that this machine was emotion blind. It had absolutely no idea how I was feeling. Often it, it, it took actions or decisions that uh, were not at all congruent with my emotional and mental state. But perhaps even worse, it was the main mode of communication I had with my family back home. And I often felt that a lot of the richness of our nonverbal communication, like our facial expressions, our vocal intonations, our gestures, all of that uh, disappeared in cyberspace when I was communicating with my device um, to other people around the world. So that set me on a path of kind of asking the question, what if our technology, what if our devices could understand human emotions just the way we understand each other? And in particular, I realized that technology is becoming mainstream and AI in particular, um, AI in particular is taking on roles that were traditionally done by humans acting on our behalf, making decisions on our behalf, uh, potentially assisting with our health care, with our productivity, you know, driving our cars, hiring our next co-workers. Yet the emphasis on building AI is very much about efficiency, automation, and there is no consideration for the human element. Uh, we're not really thinking about the emotional intelligence or the empathy aspect of this AI. And I really want to kind of bring that balance. I want to marry the IQ and the EQ uh, in our devices, in our technologies. And I really fundamentally believe that this has the power not only to reimagine our relationship with technology and, and, and human machine interfaces, uh, but more importantly, reconnect humans in more powerful ways and, and bring empathy into the equation in terms of human to human connection and communication. All right, so how do, you know, how do you go about building emotional intelligence into technology? What does that look like? You know, if we dissected how humans communicate, only 10% of how we communicate is in the choice of words we use. 90% is nonverbal, and it's split equally between um, you know, our facial expressions, which are very, very expressive and, and communicative, uh, our vocal intonations and our gestures. Um, I've spent the, the most of my career focusing on the face. As you can tell, I'm pretty expressive. And as it turns out, the science of facial emotions has existed for over 200 years, starting with the work of Duchenne and later on Charles Darwin, and, and then more recently Paul Ekman and his team in the 70s, who have really mapped every facial muscle into um, a code. So for example, um, um, when you smile, you are activating the zygomatic muscle, which is action unit 12. If you do a brow furrow, that's the corrugator muscle, and that's action unit 4. To become a certified face reader or fax coder, you have to go through hundreds of hours of training, and it's a very laborious exercise to then be able to code what expressions are happening on the human face. So instead, we use computer vision and machine learning to automate that process, and it essentially looks uh, like the following. We provide the algorithm or the computer with hundreds of examples, hundreds of thousands of examples of people smiling or smirking or frowning. And the machine is able to look for um, all the things that are similar between people's smiles and people's smirks. And it learns. The more data you give it, uh, the better it becomes. The more diverse data you give it, the better and more robust and more accurate it becomes. And I'll come back to the diversity uh, um, the data diversity issue in a, in a second. So you train, you train these algorithms to detect these different uh, nonverbal signals. We started off with the face and later on added vocal intonations. And then we're continuing to add things like activities like eating or drinking or sleeping. Um, and again, the more data you feed it, uh, the more sophisticated, if you like, the machine becomes. There are so many applications of this technology. Um, uh, when we first started, actually, when I first came to MIT as a postdoc right after my PhD, I explored the applications of the technology for autism. Um, we envisioned, this was way back in 2006, so it was way before Google Glass, but we essentially envisioned something like a Google Glass. So a pair of glasses with a little camera that sits in the middle, 
and uh, kids on the autism spectrum wore the glasses and it was connected to a device that in real time gave them, uh, it was like a coach, a real time coach. It gave them real time feedback on the expressions of uh, people they were interacting with. Now the, the issue with autism is, is often, um, you know, individuals on the spectrum find the face so overwhelming, they avoid face and eye contact altogether. So they're completely missing out on that 90% of communication we're talking about which impacts their ability to make friends if they're in school, their ability to keep jobs if they're adults. So it has a lot of dire consequences. With this device, it, encouraged, it gamified the whole thing. It, 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 uh, it gave you points every time you actually made face contact and it provided a real-time um, incentive to learn about these expressions and incorporate them into your communication. Uh, we found that the kids, um, you know, we deployed this in a school in Providence. Um, the kids were getting really better uh, with their social interactions, which was awesome. But it, it was still kind of a research project. It was funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, so it was limited in scope, if you like. So in parallel, being at the Media Lab at MIT, we started to get a lot of commercial interest in the technology. And I should say at that point, uh, my career aspirations was to become faculty at MIT. I, I wasn't at all thinking about starting a company um, and I was in fact getting ready to apply for a faculty position. But I remember, you know, twice a year at the Media Lab, we would invite all of these cor corporate sponsors um, and it, it, it for show and tell. So you would show your latest and greatest. In fact, we called it demo or die to kind of underscore how important it was to, um, you know, showcase your technology. So for a number of years in a row, uh, we would showcase the autism application of this technology and all these companies, all these Fortune 500 companies like Bank of America or Procter & Gamble or Toyota, Google, they all wanted to use the technology to quantify people's emotional experiences for a variety of reasons. So I kept a log of all these different use cases. Every time a company said, oh, we want to use this for X, Y, and Z, I just kept a list of all these different uh, scenarios. And when the list got to about 20 or so companies, Roz Picard, who uh, was the MIT professor I was working with, and myself, we barged into our lab director's office and we said, you know, Frank, um, we need uh, more you know, resources because we're ignoring all of this industry's interest. And he said, it's time for you to spin out. And I thought a lot about it because obviously I was changing my, my career aspirations. And for me, what was really the tipping point was I felt like I had a unique opportunity to take a technology that had a lot of potential of, for good and scale it, bring it to the world at a global scale. From the get-go, Roz and I, I remember when we were first starting, um, we recognized that there were so many applications of this technology. Everything from improving road safety by detecting driver drowsiness, to quantifying mental health in ways that has not been done before, right? There are facial and vocal biomarkers for things like stress, anxiety, depression, suicidal intent, Parkinson's. Imagine if we can detect all of that just off of your cell phone. Very, very transformative. But at the same time, we recognize that this data is very personal and there is a lot of potential for abuse. So we wanted to decide on a set of core values that if you like, would become our North Star in, in how we made decisions as a company. These are well encapsulated into three criteria. First, the importance of consent and opt-in. So any place where we feel that, you know, people are not really opting in or they're not consenting or they don't really understand exactly how the technology is being used, that we would decline that business, even if it meant turning business and revenue away. The second was about um, this understanding of power asymmetry, right? Um, often cases, and, and it's very true in a lot of our tech, the tech giants around us and, and in a few cases governments, they have access to most of the data about us and we have very little control about how that data is being used. And we felt, and, and often, as a consumer, you don't even get value in return for sharing this very personal data. So for me, I wanted to make sure that the applications we engage in, that, that our users had, they're getting some value in return for this, for sharing this data. It could be monetary value. In some use cases, we pay people to share this data with us. Uh, but in other cases, it's, it's a value like improving, you know, their uh, road safety, uh, for instance. 
And then the third has integrity. And, and that really meant that we were prioritizing things like the ethics of the technology, um, that we had to make sure that our algorithms were not biased. Um, this is really important. And I th for me, this is like the biggest issue right now in the space of artificial intelligence. It's not that the robots are going to take over the universe. Honestly, it's, it's that we are, we're just building bias into these systems and then deploying them at scale. Um, unintentionally, but, but with really dire consequences. So for us at Affectiva, we really prioritize mitigating data and algorithmic bias. The number one way to do this is to ensure that the team that is designing and deploying uh, these AI technologies is diverse and is inclusive. Uh, and we go, uh, you know, I'm not going to pretend that we're done. Uh, it, we're, we're a work in progress, like, like a lot of the industry, but we really prioritize that. I also, you know, as part of mitigating data and algorithmic bias, we have to ensure that our data is diverse. Uh, so far, we have collected over uh, 9.5 million facial videos from 90 countries around the world through our work with 25% uh, of the global Fortune 500 companies. So it's a very diverse data set. We need to ensure that we sample it in the right way, that you know, there's equal representation of different ages and genders and ethnicities, and maybe even people wearing the hijab or people with beards or facial masks. Uh, we've had to retrain our algorithms uh, now that you know, a lot more people are uh, engaging with us with facial masks. And to make sure that this is a priority for the company, you know, we're a small startup. We've raised about $53 million in, in venture funding. Uh, we're about 100 uh, people. Um, so we're relatively small, right? Um, and, and we're always and continuously under a lot of pressure as a company to bring product to market and pr bring new features to the market. Um, but I've actually tied our leadership's bonus plan uh, to, you know, one, one of the main kind of criteria in this bonus plan is ensuring that our algorithms are not biased. I know from talking to other peers in the industry that this is not common practice, but I honestly believe that un until we do that, uh, companies like ours and other companies in the AI space may not really prioritize ensuring that their algorithms are not biased. It's hard because there's this tension between bringing product to market faster and then doing it the right way. And I feel like we have to incentivize doing it the right way. And I've been advocating very vocally about that. So anyway, so way back when we spun out of MIT, these were our three criteria and we got tested on them. So a few years later, um, our seed money was, was running out and uh, we were back raising money and we got a phone call from the um, venture arm of an intelligence agency. And, you know, they said, we've been following you for years, very curious about your work. We think there's a lot of application in the space of lie detection and surveillance and security. And we'd like to give you $40 million of funding. <laughs> and I remember we were literally like two months away from, from, from running out of money and not making payroll. So for us, it was a real decision moment, right? On the one hand, we could take this money, we'd have to pivot, but the, con the company would continue to exist. On the other hand, if we didn't take the money, we might cease to exist altogether. So we had this existential question. But I remember going back home one night and just kind of imagining what the world would look like if we took that money and, I, uh, and, and pivoting to working on this. And I just really didn't feel that that was in line with why we started Affectiva. Our start was in autism and bridging this communication gap between people, between companies. Um, so, you know, we, we went we basically turned down that funding and instead hunkered down on finding investors that shared our core values and, and our approach. And we were able to do that. And we raised $7 million that, that year, that summer. So not as much as, 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 as we could have, but uh, I really think, you know, these investors are still very supportive of the company um, and they continue to share our core values. So I, I think, aligning with your investors. And honestly, um, we need more investors who prioritize AI ethics, who look for startups and companies that have these strong core values. So it's not just about the AI innovators and thought leaders and founders and entrepreneurs. I think the entire ecosystem needs to evolve to value um, these um, core values like ethics and like 
data bias and diversity and inclusion. You know, we raised um, $26 million in, in 18 months ago, and I was adamant that this time round I bring in um, investors that are really representative of our commitment to um, diversifying to AI. And so we were able to bring in Motley Fool Ventures and uh, Trend Forward Capital. They both have female partners and they also have uh, a, a black person of uh, a black person as, as one of their partners as well. So um, I'm just really proud that we were able to extend our commitment to building AI ethically, uh, not just internally with our team, but also our investors and who we choose to partner with. I'm very excited about the future. For me, uh, this is the beginning. This is the beginning of building human-centric AI. There is so much opportunity and, 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 and we're at the beginning of the road. Some of the things I'm really excited about, as I said, there's a lot of applications in the automotive industry. Um, everything's starting from the cars of today and the fleets of today, uh, where we are able to detect things like driver drowsiness and distraction, maybe even intoxication. Uh, and, and you can imagine how a smart vehicle that has some semi-autonomous capabilities can say, oh, you know what, like at this moment in time, I'm actually way more, uh, you know, way more, I'm going to be a safer driver than you are, and it can take over control for a bit. So there's a lot of applications in that space, but even beyond the cars of today, and as we look into autonomous vehicles and robo-taxis, you can imagine how this technology or in-cabin sensing can really transform uh, the in-cabin experience, the riding experience. We can personalize it. We can, you know, you can change the configuration of the vehicle to, um, to make it a Zen environment and, ha and help you like sleep or nap or meditate or you can turn it into a productive environment or a social environment. And for that, you need to understand the uh, emotional and mental state of the occupants in the vehicle, everything from how many people are in the car, how are they interacting, what's their demographic. Um, there's an, one application is a child left behind. Unfortunately, every year, you know, some kids are left in the vehicle, they're forgotten and, and they, they die of the heat, which is, obviously horrific, um, but technology can really help with that. Um, it can detect if there's a child left behind and it can alert uh, the parent uh, through a text message. And a lot of this can be avoided. So I'm excited about the opportunities in, you know, reimagining the future of transportation. Um, there are also a lot of applications, as I said, around mental health. You know, when you walk into a doctor's office, uh, you are not asked, what is your temperature? We just measure it. Or like, what's your blood pressure? You just measure all of these vital signs. But with mental health, the gold standard is still on a scale from one to 10. How depressed are you or how stressed are you? Um, and we can absolutely do better. Uh, by quantifying objective longitudinal data around your uh, facial and vocal biomarkers and map that into more objective scales of, you know, again, stress, anxiety, depression, pain, right? Pain is another one where, you, you, you know, you get this pain scale on a scale from one to 10, like how much pain are you in? And it's so subjective. Um, but we can quantify this data and we can um, build, you know, normative scales. Um, you can imagine how your Alexa with your permission, of course, it gets to know your baseline. And over time, it can detect if you're having a really bad day or worse, if you are showing signs, early signs of depression or Parkinson's and it can flag that to you or it can flag that to a physician or a clinician again with your permission. So there's a lot of applications where um, this technology by knowing you, by knowing you really well, it can be a coach, it can be a companion that can help you uh, become a more, not only productive person, but a more empathetic human being as well. And so I'm excited about exploring that future. Ultimately, I imagine that um, emotion AI or artificial emotional intelligence uh, becomes the de facto human machine interface. It's how we interact, like basically how we interact with our devices and our machines mirrors how we interact with one another. One of my favorite examples, which is very relevant giving, given kind of our, uh, how much time we spend in the house, all of us, um, is this smart fridge where you uh, walk up to the fridge and it says, you know what, Rana, like I know you're stressed or I know you're bored or whatever, 
but this is the fifth time you're going to eat Ben and Jerry's ice cream and I'm not going to let you do that and it just locks down. <laughs> um, so you can imagine how we can get really creative with the Internet of Things and devices around us if they have this understanding of human behavior and human emotion and use that to persuade us to live healthier and um, yeah, healthier and happier lives. I think this whole area of AI, but specifically emotion AI, is, is very nascent. And as a thought leader um, in this space, I feel a, a moral responsibility to drive the direction of this technology. And so as an innovator, but also as the CEO of Affectiva, I'm very vocal about the potential for good, but also where all of this can go wrong. For example, we have an, we hold an annual summit where we bring um, AI thought leaders and technology innovators um, and ethicists and academics and young people uh, around the table and try to really craft what this future is going to look like. In fact, we're also part of the Partnership on AI, which is a consortium that was started by the tech giants, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and IBM, as well as Amnesty International and ACLU to ensure that AI is built to benefit society. And they've invited a number of startups like Affectiva to be part of this consortium. And um, I'm on the FATE committee, which is Fair, Accountable, Transparent, and Ethical AI. And our task is to build best practices around the use of uh, AI. In fact, we just wrap, wrapped up a project um, around Emotion AI in particular, where we mapped out all of the amazing transformative applications, but also what could go wrong? What are some of the unintended consequences? And we try to draw the line and kind of map out all of these different applications. And, and, and so as a, as a result of all of this work, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for thoughtful regulation. I do really believe that in the tech industry has an opportunity to partner in a very productive way with the government to ensure that this technology is both built and deployed ethically. One of the things I'm most proud of in, in this whole journey is our um, training and internship program, um, which we started about four, four or so years ago. We bring in not only postgrads and undergrads, but also high school students. And we try to really make it diverse. We don't just pull into your usual suspects like prep schools who have coding classes or really advanced computer science classes. We really try to tap into communities that are disenfranchised and, and don't necessarily have access to companies like Affectiva. And a lot of these kids don't even have any coding experience. But we bring them in. This year we're doing it virtually, so we're able to uh, extend our footprint beyond the U.S. It's an international program. And we pair um, these youth with Affectiva uh, folks as well as graduate mentors. And it's really focused on um, inspiring the next generation of AI thought leaders and really instilling in this new, you know, young generation that the future is in our hands. We can decide what this technology turns out to be and we can ensure that it works for, for all of us. Um, and these, you know, these kids are asking awesome questions and really kind of challenging us, I would say, uh, around you know, what we're building and how we're building all of this technology. And so that, that gives me a lot of hope in the future. Again, excited uh, to be doing this. And I fundamentally believe that in building human-centric AI, we have an opportunity to not only reimagine human-machine interfaces, but, uh, but really transform human-to-human -human communication. Thank you. Well, thank you for sticking with us for the uh, live Q&A portion of our program this morning. Um, my name is Shannon Rosner, and I serve Chautauqua Institution as Chief of Staff and Vice President of Strategic Initiatives. I am so excited to be joined live by our speaker, Dr. Rana L. Kalyubi, who joins us um, as she recorded from her home this morning near Boston. Um, welcome. Welcome to Chautauqua. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. I wish we were there in person together, but um, I'm still glad to be here with you all. 
Yeah, and, and I wish you were here too. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who, after listening to your talk, is just jumping out of my seat with excitement to talk about all the things you touched on. We could spend probably an hour on each of the points you made. Um, so really excited to jump into some of the questions, but do want to go on the record inviting you to join us live um, in, a, in a future time when we can, um, because it's just, uh, it's just, there's, you're right, this is nascent and there's so much more to explore. Um, so let's jump into it um, and start exploring. Before we do though, I have to uh, remind everybody that if you're joining us, you can submit questions in a number of different ways. You can do um, questions.chq.org and I know that there's, there's gonna be a banner on the bottom of your screen telling you this, but I'll say it as well. Um, you can go on Twitter using the hashtag CHQ2020 as well. So let's start getting those questions in in, but um, during your talk, a few of them actually all, already rolled in um, and wanted to start with something about, you mentioned how you had to retrain your algorithms around um, face coverings now that so many people are wearing them. And just wonder if you could dive a little bit into that. Um, are the eyes the most expressive part of the face? So this isn't a big deal. Like how, how are you adjusting things and how's it going? Yeah, um, yeah, it, it is. It is super fascinating because obviously we rely on the lower half of the face for a lot of our communication. Just because this is like our mouth, this is where the words come out. But, but as it turns out, even when you're smiling, if it's a real um, Duchenne smile or a genuine like enjoyment smile, you actually activate other muscles in your face, like the crow feet wrinkles, which is action unit six. It's a cheek razor, so it creates all these wrinkles over here. Um, so what we're seeing is that when you um, when you do cover the lower half of your face, you need to exaggerate some of your expressions so that they can manifest in the upper half of the face, but also use things like head gestures and, and, and hand gestures that can accentuate uh, some of these nonverbal signals. Um, in my book, I, I write about how my smile is my uh, superpower. So I feel a little, you know, I've obviously been wearing masks, but I, I do feel that a little bit of my superpower that I've lost some of it. So I, I do try to really uh, amplify my expressions uh, through the eyes. I, I have to ask, were you always this expressive or did your research make you more expressive? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't have the data to prove that, but I do think I'm now a lot more um, cognizant of, of people's and, and my own nonverbal signals for sure. <laughs> so how accurate is, I, I'm impressed by how much data you've collected. I'm so impressed and I want to go into this in a little bit about how careful you've been to collect data without bias. We, we had Nick Thompson of Wired Magazine with us yesterday and he said something like problematic data equals problematic AI, right? So, yeah. so the need to be aware of that um, and take steps to move forward, I, I do want to touch on um, a little bit. Um, but but how, how has your data collection um, um, still, where are the gaps? What, what are, are you still struggling with? Are, are is it, do you feel like you've, you've achieved that goal? No, I, I would say it's a work in progress for sure. And we are pushing the state of the art in, in AI and machine learning. So um, the way this works is basically, um, ideally, you have an example, every example, like let's say I'm training a smile classifier. And smile is actually easier because it's the most commonly occurring expression. But let's say I'm training the system to recognize drowsiness, right? So I want to recognize when a driver is falling asleep at the wheel, obviously has super dire implications and for safety. Um, so ideally we have examples of all ethnic groups, all age ranges, all genders, people with beards and glasses, people wearing a hat, you know, a base cap or a hat, or a hat whatever, um, wearing masks, you want you want to check all of the different combinations, right? So you, maybe you want like a, a middle-aged white woman wearing a facial mask, falling asleep, right? That's a ton of data. Like very quickly, it becomes very exponential. 
um, and very costly. So one path that we're taking is to collect all of this data and do our best to check all of these boxes and subpopulations. But another way we're approaching this is using a new approach in machine learning called data synthesis, where you are essentially um, synthesizing the data, right? So if you have an example of me falling asleep in the daylight, and now you want to simulate me falling asleep at night, you change the environment, you synthesize, you use my data to create other examples or other instances of, um, you know, of, of me doing various things. Um, so it's a, a brand new field within AI. It's super promising, and we're investing a lot of mind and, and money into um, into figuring this out because you're absolutely right. Problematic data equals problematic AI. If we don't address the bias in the data, we are going to end up with bias in these algorithms. And then we deploy these AI systems at scale, right? Like you can imagine a driver monitoring system that we install in a global car manufacturer. Um, and then and then you've got the bias now at scale. So it's it's a really, to me, it's the biggest issue in AI today. And is one of the concerns um, that that we're not are we able to fool the technology? I guess so. I have a I have a friend who is just kind of straight faced most of the time, um, mm -hmm. and even when he's ecstatic about something, you'll get a nod, right? So, so for people who aren't maybe as expressive as you are, are they able to fool the technology and it thinks they're miserable when they're actually ecstatic? No, so, um, so we have what we call a baselining algorithm. So it actually follows you for a few minutes just to understand what's your baseline. <clears throat> so if you're like me, very expressive, then the algorithm will know that my baseline is actually a smile. So it has to be like an even bigger smile to count. Um, we also have benchmarks by geography or by, by, by culture. So we found that, you know, um, East Asian cultures tend to be less expressive than say Brazilians, right? And so you can't compare, I don't know, a Japanese individual with a Brazilian individual. You have to kind of consider that there are some cultural differences in terms of how people express, um, their emotions. Um, and then the holy grail, of course, is to develop an algorithm or, or, or a device that really gets to know you. So you interact with it day in, day out, like Amazon Alexa or Siri. And over time, it, it really knows what your true baseline is so that if you deviate from it, it can flag that for a variety of, of applications, including mental health. So you mentioned you mentioned um, you you've been mentioning a lot of the different uses um, and the ethics around it. Qu a bunch of questions here that I'm just going to try to summarize around. Okay, we trust you. Rana's got the bias thing down and aware of it and very ethical. But you're not the only one in this industry, and you mentioned it's growing. What is the work around? You mentioned the consortium. How? How much teeth does that have? What's going on in the world? Is there some sort of effort to create like a, a something similar to a, the climate agreements around the use of AI? There are a lot of threads happening in that space. Um, so, you know, I did mention the partnership on AI, which we are part of. And as a matter of fact, um, I was just reviewing, um, so they started an initiative called Emotion AI or Affective Computing, trying to um, bring people from industry, but also ACLU. I mean, they were very active in that initiative. And we met a few times and the white paper, literally, we just wrote the white paper. And the idea is to disseminate that to all sorts of organizations and practitioners. Um, and we tried to identify like all of the possible use cases but also we try to ideate like where could things go wrong so it's quite interesting in that it, it, it balances it's not naive it's optimistic but it's not naive um and and yeah the idea is to is to again disseminate this and you know other other members of this included microsoft intel um so i'm 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 happy that the conversation is happening and we're trying to set a really high bar also through the World Economic Forum, 
there was um, the Future Council on Robotics and AI, which I was, I was part of, and it was a very international council. That was harder, to be honest, to drive any real change. We we met, you know, a few times a year, and um, we tried to come up with, I don't know, like general guidelines. But but I feel like that one was a lot harder to really push through, which is a concern, right? Because different different nations have different views of what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, yeah, there is no, there's no international agreement at the moment. So how do you go forward in your work? Um, a theme that's sort of been emerging actually throughout our season is that so much of what, so many of the things we're talking about right now are, there's good applications and there are bad applications of everything and how you wrestle with the ethics of something that, um, that can be used for either. How do you personally sleep at night? <laughs> yeah, I, I really see my role. It's so interesting because over the past few, I mean, I've, we've always thought about the ethics of all of this, but particularly in the last, I'd say, five or so years, I've seen my role or the way I've, I see my role is no longer just the CEO of this you know, tech slash AI startup, but really as a thought leader in this space. And I, I feel an obligation to be very vocal about where this technology can go. Again, one reason I wrote the book is I want, and I, want, I, and I wrote the book for a very accessible audience. It's not an AI book. It's, it's designed to include everybody in the conversation because I feel consumers need to and ought to have a really strong say in where this technology goes, right? Um, so I, you know, for example, we, we organized this annual summit, right? And the idea of the summit is to bring everybody around the table and really try to direct where we go with this technology. I, I mean, I really feel we are change agents and we're change makers and we have agency to shape where this goes collectively. And I really want to be part of it and, and advocate for it. So, um, yeah, I, I think... The way, yeah, the way I see it is that I, I can have a strong say in this, and I'm really trying to use my platform not just to hopefully make my company successful, but to make this general space, uh, you know, moving in the right direction. You, I can really sense that that ethos running through you, and it's so refreshing and, and awesome. Um, I want to switch a little bit to some more technical questions. Um, including, we have a really smart community here, and um, often this will happen where I get a question that I don't even understand, but I ask <laughs> it anyway because somebody wants to know. And this is, this is the one for you. There's been a lot of buzz in recent weeks about the unveiling of GPT-3 as yeah. a major leap forward in AI. Can you help us understand why there's so much excitement? First, you need to help me understand what that is. Hi, okay. Please. Uh, this is actually very, yeah, very interesting. So it's op open AI, which is um, one of kind of the AI kind of organizations that are really advancing machine learning. Um, <clears throat> I believe Elon Musk is the founder or co-founder of it. Um, so they just released a platform called GPT-3 and there's a ton of excitement around it because a lot of people believe it's like the next generation of deep learning, like it's going to take it's, it's not it's not similar to deep learning, but it's going to take the whole field forward. Uh, we are at Affectiva still evaluating how um, how exciting this is and how relevant it is to us. Um, from what I've seen so far, it isn't necessary. So the way our work, our algorithm or our, our space works, we need images. It's all about image processing and computer vision. It's not clear to me where GPT-3 fits in, in that equation, but there's definitely a lot of buzz around it, and I have my team looking into it. Um, so that's, I, I think this is kind of a non-answer, because I have, it's so new that we don't even know um, how applicable it is to our space, but it's, uh, there is definitely a lot of buzz. Um, I, <clears throat> I saw this, I saw this uh, investor tweet, <laughs> which I thought was really funny. He was like, oh, is everybody like updating, like doing a replace all, like deep learning with GPT-3? And I was like, okay, that's like really funny, so. 
We should see that. <laughs> well, see, we've already identified one of the questions we'll ask you next year when you come back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I will have an answer by next year for sure. <laughs> Great. So um, a really cool question going back to you mentioned you've started, you went from using facial expressions to hand gestures and even language. And somebody's asking a question about tonal languages like Thai. Do, does that um, convey emotion differently than a non-tonal language? And how do you account for that? Yeah, when we first started um, doing kind of our research around vocal intonations, we trained the algorithm on an exclusively Chinese data set, and then we, we wanted to see if it generalized to German and English. And we found that by and large it did, which was, was excellent news. Um, my guess it's going to be very similar to the face, where by and large the facial expressions are universal, but there are cultural rules that depict when people decide to share an expression or amplify it or dampen it or mask it. I think we're going to see some cultural kind of specificities around, um, you know, different languages, and we're going to have to consider build that into a, in, into the system. It's it's currently not it's language agnostic at the moment. So you touch on building it into the system, which which actually brings us to another question. There was a a questioner asking. You've clearly controlled the bias in the data very well, but somebody's entering that data. What are you doing to control the bias of, of how you collect it and enter it? Is there bias there and what are you doing to control it? Yeah, there, I mean, if the way we think about it is like there's a machine perception pipeline. It starts with data collection and then there's the data annotation and of course data synthesis. Um, then you have training the model validating the model and then you rinse and repeat and at every step of this process you can introduce bias um, the way mit we mitigate this honestly the, the best way to mitigate bias is to ensure that your your, your team that is that is across this entire pipeline is a diverse team and that it's inclusive so um, we just make sure that I mean there I, uh, you know, there are multiple examples where members in our team said, oh, you know, we're missing this type of person in our data set. Like, why don't we have people wearing the hijab or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, uh, or people with facial beards. Um, so I, I think it's important that we just make sure that the teams who are thinking through all the different pieces of this pipeline are as diverse as possible, because um, that's how you um, kind of flag the, the blind spots. The other thing that is really interesting, when I, when I did my PhD like over 20 years ago, the way you reported accuracy results was you had one data set and you said, okay, my accuracy on smile detection on this data set is 99%. That's actually a problem because you can easily, right? There could be biases in subpopulations within that data set, but in aggregate it's hidden. And so where the machine learning industry is moving um, you train by ensuring a, a, a sub, you know, an equal sampling of different subpopulations, but the way you validate the data is you have to break it up into these smaller data sets, um, you know, of different ethnic groups or different um, age ranges so that you can identify if there are biases. So again, I think the whole industry is just trying to figure out new ways to collect data, new ways to annotate, new ways to train and validate. In, um, in ways that can uncover these biases. Very cool, thank you. Um, different tact, this question is asking, um, so a lot of us experiencing Zoom fatigue right now. Mm -hmm. um, is there, I remember a few years ago, we had a speaker here at Chautauqua who showed us a, a, a video clip of an, an AI coffee talk where people were, it was as if I was with my friend from California having coffee over a table. And I wonder if your, your work has any application in that where it could help, help us have better interpersonal, you talked about this started when your way of interacting with your family back home was so so but i'm having trouble understanding how could it help me if you and i you're in boston and i'm here and i'm i'm just having zoom fatigue if we were applying your your technology right now how would it be helping me how would my experience be different i i just think um 
Or do you and apply it in that context? Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of applications in video conferencing and telehealth. I mean, that the, the whole basically, you know, pandemic has accelerated the interest in our technology in these industries. The way I think about it is um, it's not necessarily going to make us feel like we are. Well, that's not true. OK, so here's the example, right? You and I, if we were in Chautauqua right now, we would get a sense of the energy in the room, right? Right. But, but we can't. So with Emotion AI, even if people still had their video cameras off, like I don't need to see, you know, the hundreds of people who are tuned in right now. But it would be awesome to see an aggregate, like a, 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 um, a graph or some visualization, like a bubble diagram, I don't know, um, that encapsulates how much energy there is between our audiences, right? Um, so I think that would mitigate Zoom fatigue because we wouldn't require everybody, like I'm on Zoom calls, like a lot of us, back to back, you know, all day long. Well, sometimes I wish I could just like turn the video camera off, but I still want to be part of the conversation and, and, and have that feeling that, that I'm part of, right? Um, so if the technology could still capture my nonverbal signals and ensure that I'm contributing to the energy in the room, I think that could help a little bit. Um, yeah, so it's it, I, I think what we're going to see is just a lot of innovation around how do we create virtual shared experiences um right like how do we how do we replicate or get as close as possible to this feeling that we're all at chautauqua and the serendipitous interactions all of that we have not figured out how to model virtually yet um so so i think one of the outcomes of this pandemic is we're going to see a whole new slew of innovations um so i'm excited to see what comes out of that so I just want to switch to the personal a, a little bit. Um, your ethical your your ethical stances are so strong, and it's very clear that you wrestle with this, and you're motivated to to be ethical in in an industry that has a chance to to go in a different direction. Can you talk a little bit about where that comes from for you personally? Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. So I mean, I I grew up I grew up in the Middle East. Um, where some of the values I think you know that were instilled in us as a family, obviously hard work was number one. Um, but also we traveled a lot. Like my parents basically invested everything they worked hard for into our education, and education meant both in-class education but also cultural education. So they made sure <clears throat> that every summer we got to travel and experience other cultures. And for me, that that just um, created a lot of compassion and empathy like I'm, we're very compassion and empathy is one of our core values as a family and I try to instill that in my two kids as well um, and just an open-mindedness to up to the other like instead of a fear of the other it's an open-mindedness and wanting to really help and and, and respect um, other people and I think that's really this kind of appreciation or celebration of human connection um, yeah, I think that's like really part of who we are as a family and it's definitely one of our core values as, as a company and I think it's really at the core of who I am as a leader. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's rare to meet a leader who, you know how some people have their work, their work persona and their personal persona and it seems very clear that you don't have that breakdown, that you are who you are in all aspects of your life, which is a huge compliment and I hope you take it that way. Um, but so, so you had touched in your, in your talk on, you had the intelligence agency interested and and you ended up not going in that direction but we are getting a question about is there is there some use in like interrogations for example where we've heard a lot about police work rec in recent weeks um, and um, I'm I'm actually I used to practice I'm trained as a lawyer and remember studying a lot about how false confessions happen in, in the process. Is there room here for the technology to help avoid some of that? And if you have a computer almost doing the interrogation and reading the person being interrogated? 
Yeah, I have to say, like, in, especially in the last, again, like, probably, you know, last few months, there's there's been a big debate on whether so, so we we just we just basically every time any government approaches us we basically say no we're we're sorry we're not going to provide this technology um and and usually the use cases fall in the category of surveillance security lie detection because i feel like if we got approached to partner with the government on helping you know with ptsd then i i feel like we would be more open to that but I have been getting some pushback where basically, you know, some people are saying, hang on a second, like this is public service. Like if you are not going to partner with the police or the government, who, it, you know, then, then, then our government is going to fall behind uh, from a technology standpoint. I get that argument. I just feel, I think, I just feel that there's so much potential for abuse and things could really go wrong. If there's a teeny weeny bit of bias built into the algorithm, it could manifest in all sorts of profiling and discrimination against people. Um, so I just don't, I, A, I don't feel it's the right time for the technology, and, and B, I don't know that we have the right, um, uh, what do you call it, like right controls in place to make sure that this cannot be abused. Um, so I, I, so I get the counter argument. I, I just don't feel comfortable at all. And we have these internal debates of the company too. You know, every so often when some of these awful gun violence um, incidents happen, we have an internal debate where we're like, okay, our technology could potentially help. But again, I just feel like the technology is not ready and the controls are not there. So we, we continue to, to turn it down. But I, I will say if somebody who's listening in really wants to have a conversation around that. Challenge me, and <laughs> I'm happy to entertain that. Great, well, this this crew will will challenge, I'm sure, <laughs> if, if we feel like we should. Um, I have to say that that when you were talking about that part in, in your talk, I got a vision of the minority report and <laughs> Tom Cruise walking through a mall and everywhere they, you go, there are cameras on his face. So um, definitely, definitely feels like the stuff of science fiction sometimes. And it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of crazy how much your work is making it a part of our lives. And, and um, the way you are thinking about applying it, it never would have occurred to me, as somebody, by the way, who's, who watched her father-in-law die from Parkinson's, if we had caught that earlier, right? The, the, this is meaningful stuff for people's lives. Um, so what, knowing that, what are, what are the things that you're most excited about? You started with autism. What are the applications you're just, get you out of bed in the morning? <laughs> um, well, there's a lot of applications. Um, obviously the work we do in automotive is, is really potentially transformative, especially with improving road safety. So I'm excited about that. I will also say like the applications to mental health more broadly is, is again, so transformative. Um, you know, one, one of my favorite stories is, is the story of Aaron Smith, who's this high school student who was watching um, a news documentary on Parkinson's. She was 15 years old and noticed that Parkinson's patients have different facial expressions, right? Um, and so she emails us and she asks for access to our technology. And of course, my head of sales was like, what do I do with this? She's like 15 year old. And I was like, let's give her access to the technology and see what she does with it. And Erin is just an amazing rock star. She now has her own company. She's studying at Stanford, trying to really push the use of this technology to in the early diagnosis, but also tracking of mental health disorders. So I think there's a lot of potential there to bring objective longitudinal data um, to address things like stress, anxiety, depression, Parkinson's, um, even suicidal intent. We have a partner who's looking into that too. Um, yeah, so that's that's an area where I think this technology can really make a huge difference. Um, but again, the, the challenge there is scale. Um, how do you do that at scale? You really need a platform that has access to a lot of people and you know, a, a call out to, to our audience here if you have ways to, I, th I think for this to, to really work out, it needs to be done at scale. So 
If you have ideas, please reach out. Well, it's like you teed it up. It's like we planned this because my next question was going to be talking about data collection. Um, somebody's saying, for those of us who know nothing about data collection, can you please provide in simple terms the steps from the initial incident where information is gathered to the input of that data somewhere to the analysis of the data? Sure. Um, okay, so let's assume just for simplicity, we want to train an algorithm that can detect smiles. So um, we have two ways to collect data. One is through our partners, which are distributed all over the world. We have, we're in 90 countries around the world. And basically one of our core products is when people watch content online, with their permission, we ask them to turn the camera on and we stream the video to our, to, you know, back to our servers. Again, usually they're compensated for that. So they know the camera's on, they're watching an online video ad or a movie trailer, and we're collecting that data with their consent and opt in. That's one way. The other way um, where we're interested in capturing people's experiences in cars, we send out these cameras and we ask people to put it in their dashboards, their dash cams, uh, what do you call them? Uh, dashboards, right? And yeah. Um, yeah, and we, and we, again, we ask them to record their daily commutes for a couple of weeks. So again, very much consent and opt-in based. Um, and this is where the diversity, because it's harder to get a diverse group when we're doing it that way, because we're usually tapping into our kind of local geography and we try to be really thoughtful about how do we expand and scale that. But once the data comes in, part of it gets forked off to these annotators or labelers who basically watch the video in slow motion and say, oh, I can see Shannon smiling here, or like she's smirking here. And part of that data becomes training data, and part of it is, is kept aside to be the validation data set. So the algorithm never, ever, ever, ever sets its eyes on the validation data set. That's kept till the very end. Then we train the algorithm. So we feed it all of these examples of Shannon smiling and Rana smiling and a whole bunch of people smiling. And it, it hopefully learns what a smile looks like. And then we test it on the validation data set. And we try to see, okay, how well does it do compared to these human annotators? Um, to make sure that the process is really accurate, we usually have five annotators um, label every video. So if there's a majority agreement, if three out of five think Shannon is smiling, we're like, okay, Shannon's probably smiling. Um, so that's how we create what we call the ground truth. Um, and we repeat that over and over for different expressions and different human states, different objects. I mean, now we're looking at things like cell phone detection and child seat detection in the car or maybe you know activity recognition are you eating or drinking so the repertoire of things we can train the machine is endless it's uh, and i i find that really exciting absolutely i'm i'm just thinking about you probably don't want my data during my commute because it would be pretty <laughs> non-diverse <laughs> i usually like this <laughs> And that's actually what we thought. So I remember we, we started this like three years ago, the automotive business unit. And I remember saying, okay, we're sending these cameras out. People are driving into work, whatever. We're not gonna see anything interesting. You would be surprised. It's actually shocking <laughs> what people do when they're driving. Um, maybe, you're, you, maybe you're like an awesome, like super disciplined driver, but people, there's a lot going on when people are driving, it's kind of scary. So. Um, that was surprising to us too. <laughs> you know, that actually brings up a question. So can your software tell um, if I'm singing what my mood is, like if I'm not talking? Because I sing a lot in the car, that's, that's the segue. Yeah, yeah we, saw, we saw a lot of examples of people like bobbing their yeah. head, tell that they're singing along. We do not have a sing-along detector uh, trained yet, but that's definitely on the roadmap because we saw examples of that. And that's great because car manufacturers want to know if you're having a good experience in the car. And so sing-along is, is, a, is a great example of that. Yeah, and think of the carpool karaoke applications <laughs> there. <laughs> um, See, so you had touched on, you had touched on all the different ways you look at people who have beards and hats and masks and, and hijab. And um, somebody's asking though about, what about diversity of body type? Does that make a difference 
um, at all? Um, it, it shouldn't, by and large, it should not. And again, we, we tried, but, but, but one example where it does manifest is, it, it, is in a car, right? Um, so if you have a really, 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 really tall person or a really, really, really short person, um, then, then, the, then the, if the camera is not positioned right, we may not be able to detect them properly. And we wouldn't know that unless we had examples of people who are very tall and very short in our data set. Um, so, that's, so I would say, yeah, that is, an, that is something that we need to be thoughtful about when we're collecting data. So, and to the person who asked this question, you're already seeing how complex this quickly becomes, right? Because you want a very, very tall woman and a very, very tall guy and, and um, a very, very, right? Like it becomes very quickly a complex problem. Um, yeah. Um, and we're getting another question that I wonder is, a, is riffing off of my mention of Minority Report. They're, they're asking, does science fiction in our culture influence technological innovation? Are you divorced from it? Do you try not to watch science fiction ever? How, do, how does that play? I, I sometimes watch science fiction. I, I don't know that it, it, it directly, it's often actually influenced by science, right? Like, so the show Lie to Me was based on Paul Ekman's um, research quantifying these facial movements, the facial action coding system. Um, so I, I and, and Minority Report was, was, was inspired by work that was done at the MIT Media Lab, which then spun out to become a company called Oblong. So I would actually think it's the other way around. Um, one of my favorite science fiction kind of movies that relate to, to my work is Her, the movie Her. Um, Scarlett Johansson and Joaquin Phoenix. Exactly. And I, what I found fascinating about that is here you have this guy, he's depressed, he doesn't want to come out, get out of bed, and, but, but because her, the operating system, um, Scarlett, basically knows him so well, she has emotional and social intelligence, and she's actually able to persuade him to change his behavior and get him out of bed, and uh, there's this scene when they go around and explore the beach. Well, I, for me, that's the, like the true power of emotion AI. If you can build a, a, a coach that can help you live healthier and happier and be more productive and more connected, well, that's awesome. Get me one of those, right? Um, what is interesting about the movie, though, is, of course, it takes a Hollywood dark twist and, um, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> and I try to ignore that part of the movie. <laughs> Fair. Um, we've been talking a lot about the potential uses and where AI is going. We have a question from somebody who identifies as a novice to AI asking, can you help me identify where AI is in my life right now? Oh, um, there's a lot of examples where um, there are machine learning dr driven um, I mean, I think the biggest example would be conversational devices like Amazon Alexa or Siri. Uh, these are all very, very AI driven or machine learning driven. I think that's the biggest example. But there are cases where there are machine learning or machine learning assisted systems that are making probably making decisions around whether you get a loan or not um, or how much of that do you get, right? Um, yeah, there's there's probably a lot of what we call narrow AI. Um, so it's like an AI that is only good at one thing and it's trained for this just one thing. And I think that's pretty ubiquitous and mainstream at this point in time. What we don't have enough examples of are the more generalized AI systems, the, you know, AGI, which, you know, we have, we're a long, long ways away from that. So you mentioned Alexa, and, and that actually brings me back to, I wanted to come back to a deeply ethical question to wrap us up. Um, you, you touched on regulation in your conversation. So a lot of people hear a lot of rumors about the way our, you know, Alexa's listening all the time, and, and I don't want to give my information to somebody like Rana because I don't know what she's going to do with it, and this fear of what's going on behind the scenes. Is regulation the answer to that? How do we get people more comfortable with the technology if it's going to become so ubiquitous? 
Yeah, I think thoughtful regulation is definitely part of the solution, and we need more of that. And but 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 honestly, I think it starts with the technology companies and the tech innovators, people like me who are, you know, running companies who are creating these technologies. We have to have a higher bar of of operation. We have to be more transparent. Um, even when you sign kind of, you know, when you, you know, you, you're opting into something and you have like pages and pages of legalese that none of us, at least I know in my family, we don't really read it. We just scroll down and we check the box. That's because it's not written in English that the majority of humans, and Shannon, you would, you would be able to parse it. <laughs> you're a lawyer, but like the majority of us, it's just like gibberish, right? Um, and I think we need a better way of doing all of this that's more transparent, it's clear what data is being collected, who's going to use it, where is it going. Um, so we, we need tech companies to step up that way. We also, um, this concept of power asymmetry, where only a small number of tech companies and governments have access to the majority of the data, and it's not clear that the value I get in return for sharing this data is on par with the value that these companies get for having the data. This asymmetry in, in power and access, I think, needs to change. So again, who's going to change that? I, I think the tech leaders need to coalesce and, and really set a higher bar. So, so agree completely. And Chautauqua is a community where we, we have to ask this question. We ask it almost every time. OK, that, that's their responsibility. But what can we do as consumers of AI to make sure that things are moving in the right direction. And I'd like to, we're actually almost out of time. Um, we may be able to sneak one more in, um, but this may be your last question. So if, I also would like you to wrap up the, the wrap into this another question, which is if, if you could design the world in 50 years, what would it look like? So what's our role? What's yeah. our role in creating that world? And then if we have time, what would that world look like? Yeah, um, absolutely every single person in, in the world has a role to play here because if consumers vote with their feet, like if consumers say, I'm going to use, you know, company A, but not company B because company A is committed to the ethical development and deployment of AI, then guess what? Company B may not, you know, may not continue to exist, right? And I think this is where I think the power of the consumer is huge and and that's where I think it's the onus is on us as consumers to become more educated and, and demystify what AI is and just really kind of be part of the conversation. I think that's really important. Um, and then what the world looks like, I really think technology has the opportunity. A, a lot of the emphasis on AI has been about making us more productive and more efficient and automating everything. Well, I really think AI can also help us be more humane and more empathetic. And so I, I really hope like, you know, in 50 years, um, we have rebuilt our technology in a way that gives us a sense of connection, not the illusion of a connection, but the real sense that we are connected um, across borders and across, across our differences. So I'm excited about that. Well, we're excited too, and I just want to thank you for taking time today to, to help demystify it a little bit and start us all on the journey of, of demystifying it and, and for all the work you're doing to create that world. Um, it's just, I can't wait to see where this goes. Um, can't wait to speak with you again. And I'm sure I speak for everyone out there in our audience across the world uh, when I say thank you so much for giving us your time this morning and good luck as you as you pursue more. Thank you so much for having me and I'm very reachable. If people want to continue the conversation, you can find me online. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Rana. CHQ Assembly is made possible through the collaboration and innovation of Chautauqua Institution's full-time and part-time staff seasonal staff, and many volunteers, as well as participants like you, whose engagement, gifts, and subscriptions sustain our mission.